Christine? Hi, my name is Danielle Fowler. I'm the vice president of the Kashmir Goat Association. And today we're lucky to have Carl Majewski. Carl has been with the University of New Hampshire Extension since 2002. And he works on the state's dairy, livestock, and forage crops team, where he focuses on forage crop production. His particular interests include managing soils and fields and pastures to keep them healthy and productive, exploring the use of new forage crops, promoting IPM practices for corn and forages. Over the years, Carl's been involved in programs focusing on pasture management, corn and forage production, and incorporating cover crops and no-till planting practices in crop rotations. So I'll remind everybody on the call to please uh, keep your microphones muted. And if you have a question, um, Carl would be happy to take them. Um, you can type them right into the chat. And with that, I will hand it over to Carl. Thanks for joining us. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here. And um, let me get my slides up on the screen again. And okay. Um, does that, that, that look good? Yep. Okay. So, um, so the title of the talk is Understanding Forage Quality. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is, um, first of all, kind of defining what we actually mean by forage quality. And um, then we'll talk a little bit about how we evaluate it, how we can, how we can measure it. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we can use it. Uh, a lot of times when I, when I give this talk, um, I'll, I'll ask the audience um, what they think the, the definition of forage quality is. And a lot of times uh, people will say things like, um, they'll mention the protein content or um, you know, maybe the, the mineral content. Sometimes they'll say something about um, you know, the, the absence of mold or something. And those are all um, those are all good, okay? And those are all part of the picture, but they're not the whole picture, okay? If we want to um, define forage quality, um, what it means, then we define it as the ability of a forage to supply nutrients for livestock and support a level of animal performance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit, okay? And I'll start with uh, animal performance, okay? Any of the livestock that we're keeping, um, we're looking for some sort of performance from them, okay? Um, you know, with goats that, if you have a lactating doe, that might be a level of, of milk production either if you're, you're, you're milking them to you know, make cheese or whatever, or if it's a doe that's just lactating to, uh, to nurse her kids. Um, with kids, it might be a, uh, a rate of growth. Um, even if you've got a mature animal that's not a lactating, that you're not breeding, um, that's not growing anymore, you still want, if really, you know, an animal that's basically just a pet, um, you're still looking for that animal to be healthy. So maintaining that health um, is maybe a sort of low level of performance, but it's animal performance just the same. So that's what we mean. Um, and it's good to keep in mind that animal um, nutritional requirements, okay, so what, what that level of support for animal performance is, is going to vary um, with different stages of production, okay? So um, for instance, uh, if we look at TDN, that stands for total digestible nutrients in a ration, it's an, it's an estimate of energy, okay, that we, that we have in the ration. Uh, you can see that a, uh, a dough in early pregnancy requires considerably less ener energy uh, than a weanling. So, uh, you know, a kid that's all done nursing and is now relying on, um, on feed uh, to support that rapid growth. Uh, if you're looking at protein, so that CP, that stands for crude protein in the ration, um, 
again, a dough in early pregnancy requires a lot less protein than a lactating, uh, than a lactating dough. Um, that's a typo there. I've used these slides for all classes of livestock, including sheep. So um, I don't wanna blow my credibility this close uh, into the talk. Anyways, um, so different animals in different stages of production um, have different nutritional requirements. Uh, I, I like this graphic. Um, this kind of shows the same thing, um, just in a different way. So, if, you know, for a mature sheep, um, most of the year, uh, it's got a fairly modest nutritional need. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> once the animal is bred, um, and then the, the ewe is, in this case, is pregnant, um, in early pregnancy, the nutritional demand is fairly low early in gestation, but then as that um, fetus gets bigger and puts on size and is starting to grow more rapidly, then the nutritional demand increases. After, um, after they give birth, then um, lactation uh, is a huge nutritional demand because not only is the, uh, the goat um, have to meet her own nutritional demands and need to stay healthy, she's got to produce milk so that she can support a level of growth uh, in, in her kids. Once the animal is, uh, once the kids are weaned, um, that nutritional demand uh, starts to decline and then we're back on that, on that baseline level. Okay. Um, that's a little bit about the, for, uh, the, the animal end of things, okay? If we talk about the forage end of things, so if we're talking about the ability of the forage to meet those nutritional demands, okay? That forage quality depends on nu nutritive value, uh, and that's gonna mean the composition of things like how much protein, how much energy, uh, what the levels of minerals are in that forage. It's also gonna depend on the digestibility um, and that's, that means how much of that feed um, can, is usable, okay? Um, but it's not just nutritive value, it's intake. So it's what's in the feed and how much of that feed an animal uh, will consume. And intake is a function of things like palatability, basically how attractive it is to the, uh, to the animal. Um, you know, we, we don't spend a lot of time getting picky about presentation or flavor or things like that. But there are some things where um, maybe a really coarse feed is really tough um, on a, on an, an inside an animal's mouth. Um, it may have some weeds in there that might give an off flavor. Um, if we're talking about fermented feeds like silages, then um, improper fermentation can contribute some off flavors, okay? And if the animal doesn't want to eat it, then it really doesn't matter how nutritious it is because it's not gonna be able to do any good. Okay. Um, that last point, how long it stays in the rumen uh, is, um, uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about. <clears throat> So goats, um, like any other ruminant, um, are able to make good use of uh, the fiber in forages in a way that other animals can't. They can digest them while we can't or pigs can't or you know, a host of other animals can't. And the way they do that, of course, is they've got this giant rumen, which is this big fermentation vat that's populated with billions of bacteria and protozoans and um, you know, a host of other beasties in there. Uh, all those microorganisms uh, have the ability to break down plant fiber and convert it into something that um, a ruminant animal is able to make use of. Um, and that's a really efficient system and it works really well, but um, it does take some time for that microbial action to break down plant fiber, 
Okay. Um, plant fiber isn't degradable uh, at the same rate that something like starch or sugars are, which can break down pretty uh, pretty quickly and um, become immediately usable. So uh, microbial digestion of fiber takes, um, takes some time. And the more fiber in a feed, the longer it's going to take. And then the longer that it takes to break down that that fiber, the longer that feed stays in the animal's rumen. And if that rumen is already full of feed that, you know, um, that that goat is working on and trying to move through the system, then it's not going to consume any more feed because it's full. Um, so what happens is that uh, particularly animals with a high nutritional demand they may not be able to consume enough feed to, make, to meet their needs, okay? If something uh, has a lot of fiber in it um, and they're filling up on that, you know, it doesn't really move through the system enough for them to consume more feed and consume more nutrients. It's sort of, sort of a bottleneck in the system. Um, we, can estimate an animal's dry matter intake, basically how much feed that animal will consume in a day as a percentage of its body weight, okay? And that's gonna be anywhere from two to three, maybe close to 4% in some extreme cases. <clears throat> animals with um, low nutritional demand, so um, animal at maintenance or early pregnancy, they're consuming about two, two and a half percent of their body weight. So 150 pound goat is gonna be consuming somewhere around three, three and a half pounds of feed per day in dry matter. Um, late pregnancy or lactating or, or growing stock um, that has that higher nutritional demand, they're consuming <clears throat> three and a half percent. So, you know, they're, they're, they may be consuming closer to four and a half or five pounds of feed per day. Excuse me. And if the feed um, is mature and has a lot of fiber in it, then they're just not gonna be able to fit all of that three and a half percent of their body weight uh, in, in their bodies when, when they're eating, okay? So intake is a big part of quality and it has a lot to do with plant maturity, okay? So like in this graphic, if you look at the, the top of the chart, um, if you look at something like the forage that you have in pasture, okay? It's nice, it's lush, it's leafy. Um, that forage itself is really chock full of nutrients. It's high in protein, it's high in energy, high in sugars, it's highly digestible. Uh, and it's low in fiber. So that forage can support a pretty high level of production with little or no other supplementation. Um, animals can grow well on it. Um, you know, mothers can, can produce milk pretty well on pasture with, in some cases, no added grain or just a little bit. As grasses get more mature, um, and they start to get into that reproductive stage where the stems get longer and then the heads start to emerge and then it starts going to seed, then that fiber builds up, okay? Plant fiber is there to provide physical support to that plant and when it's sending out that, that stem um, with that relatively heavy seed head on it, uh, it needs some structural support in order to um, be able to stand up. And so it, do the, the plant cells um, produce more cellulose, hemicellulose and lignins, things like that, that provide that structural support, okay? But that's, those, those components are the fiber that are less digestible uh, and take longer to digest in a, in a goat's rumen. So as we go down the chart, um, into early flowering and then into late flowering. And then, you know, if we were to leave grass unmowed till about this time of year, where it's really just kind of dry and desiccated, 
Uh, we go from a high level of production, high digestibility, high energy, down to very low protein, very low energy, very low digestibility. Um, and while midway, um, you know, that forage might be able to support a moderate level of production, and then maybe going down to maintaining dry stock that's not growing, that's not producing milk. Once you get into that really dry, coarse uh, feed, um, that's really not really going to support any kind of animal performance at all. Okay. When we're harvesting forages, this is what we're looking for, okay? Um, you know, when we're harvesting hay, we kind of want to compromise between um, between that 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 active green growth, um, which is highly nutritious, but there's not a lot of it. You know, um, grass around here in New Hampshire in mid-May is really good feed but there's hardly any of it. Um, and so farmers will usually wait until late May or early June to mow their fields. Um, you do lose a little bit of nutritive value on there, but at least you're, you're, comp you're compensating for it with more crop yield, okay? With grasses, we recommend harvesting it at what's called the boot stage. That means that the grasses are still pretty leafy, still highly digestible, pretty good quality, um, but they've grown up, the stems have started to elongate, and the heads haven't emerged yet, but they're just about to. Um, with legumes like clovers or alfalfa, we recommend harvesting in the bud stage. That means that the flower buds have formed, but it hasn't yet bloomed. Okay. Um, are there any quick questions about anything that I've that I've said so far before we move on? Just to clarify, no questions so far in the chat. Um, okay. Anyone else in the audience have any questions so far? Okay. So now that we've sort of talked about what forage quality is and defined it. Um, let's talk a little bit about evaluating it. Um, a visual evaluation is, is really useful. It's good to be able to look at a bale of hay and get an idea of um, how likely it is to be uh, good or, or not. So here we've got a hay. Um, and um, when I look at it, I see that there's plenty, it's, it's got a nice color to it. So it's got a nice green color. I see a lot of leafy tissue around there. It's not all leaves. I see some stems. Um, so that's going to make it a little bit more fibrous, a little bit less digestible. Uh, but overall, I would say that this is pretty good. And when we're looking at hay, the things that we like to see would be things like um, a bright green color, a high proportion of leaves, um, minimal or or preferably no weeds or or foreign material um you know i you know it's it's one thing if we see a few dandelion leaves in a in a bale of hay that's um perfectly fine um in in my in my years i've seen everything from um arrows to beer cans to dead snakes to live snakes in in hay bales and that really doesn't do anything for feed value. Um, and then hay should smell fresh. Um, you know, it should just smell good, um, sort of have a sort of vegetative, uh, vegetative, vegetative uh, scent to it. There shouldn't be anything that smells off. Now, by contrast, if you look at this hay, um, it's not the worst hay that I've ever seen, but it doesn't look as good as the hay in the previous slide. Um, rather than being green, um, it looks a lot more kind of bleached out, either because the grasses is that much more mature when they were harvested, maybe they got left out in the sun, maybe it got rained on once or twice because, uh, before it got baled. Um, I see a lot more stems, a lot more seed heads in there than in the prior photo. So I think, um, 
you know, this doesn't look as good. Things that we kind of um, that we that, that we want to be on the lookout for would be that that bleached brownish color, a sign of either excessive maturity or mishandling um, when it was out in the field. Uh, instead of seeing a lot of those nice, digestible, nutritious uh, leaves, uh, we want to be on the lookout for a high proportion of stem and seed heads. Um, maybe there'd be more contamination from weeds or things. Um, and rather than having that fresh, clean scent, um, the hay we <clears throat> the hay might smell musty. Uh, it might have dust. It might even have moldy patches. Um, I will say that you want to be careful if you suspect that the hay might be musty. Um, you don't want to stick your nose in there because you can um, make yourself pretty sick with that. Um, once I was judging hay at our county fair and um, I opened up a flake and stuck my nose right in and then ended up with a sinus infection after that. So, uh, but, you know, from a distance, if you're... Um, you smell anything off, then, then that should be a red flag there. Um, I mentioned earlier about how palatability is something that we, uh, that affects forage quality. Some of the things that can influence palatability would be compounds produced by the plant that can be both good or bad. Um, on the bad side, that can be things, just things like alkaloids that might give a, um, a grass, for instance, um, a, a bitter flavor. Um, on the good part, it can be things like sugars that um, really make the, um, the hay attractive to livestock. The stage of maturity can affect palatability. Coarser feeds are gonna be um, harder to, to chew, to, to eat, and um, they're gonna be more prickly. Uh, and so animals don't like eating, you know, tough prickly things any more than we do. Uh, contamination from weeds or, you know, if a chunk of manure um, gets picked up in a bale, things like that. Uh, with silage, certain fermentation acids from poor fermentation uh, can give off flavors. Um, and then there are things like molds or mycotoxins those are generally the result of poor um, hay handling or curing. Um, molds are pretty self-explanatory. Mycotoxins are compounds that are produced by fungi and they tend to be more of an issue in silages. Um, it's not the mold, it's that the mold produces these compounds uh, that can result in, um, in some cases, some pretty severe toxicity. Now, it's good to have an idea of how to evaluate forages visually, okay? Um, but that only gets you so far. So this, um, this, this chart here is um, summarized from a study that was done in, Pen or a survey that was done in Pennsylvania uh, some years ago. And they had a, um, a, a number of hay samples at a, uh, at a hay auction in the area. And they surveyed experienced hay dealers, um, asking them to identify which one was the best hay. And um, you can see that 45% of the people um, that they surveyed um, picked the lowest quality hay based on the visual evaluation. Looking at it, they said, this is the best one and it had the lowest um, feed value score. And only 20% of these, and again, experienced people, people who deal with hay all the time and, and are um, pretty experienced, still only 20% actually were able to identify uh, the highest quality hay based on their, uh, on their visual evaluation. So the moral of the story is, is that it only goes so far. Um, so, um, oops, I'm sorry, I thought I had a slide on there. So we recommend um, 
you know, sending in samples of hay uh, for analysis uh, on a regular basis. It's just a good management practice so that um, you know what you're feeding. Um, if you're purchasing hay, um, talk to the person that you're um, buying from. Some people will um, have their hay analyzed and can offer analyses to their customers. Um, if not, it's something that's good for you to do um, on your own. So I wanna talk a little bit more about um, using forage quality, okay? So there can be a range of, of values with any given hay. Some of them are gonna be higher in protein or higher in digestibility. Some of them are gonna be lower. Um, and the animals that we keep are also going to vary as we, as we talked about earlier in their uh, nutritional requirements. Some have high requirements, some don't. And um, what's best for the animals, what's most cost-effective is making sure that you're matching the quality to your animal's needs. So I've got two tables here and the one on the left um, is a survey from the University of Vermont from some years ago um, where they just published, uh, this is when they were operating their own feed lab. And this was a summary of the uh, crude protein and the total digestible nutrients um, for first cutting and second cutting. Okay. Um, and that's showing the average. And then right below the average is the range in values for, for each of those. On the right, I've got um, nutritional <clears throat> requirements for does, um, both at maintenance um, and six to eight weeks into lactation. Now, you can see that while it's not a perfect match, the nutritional needs of the does uh, at maintenance, so without really um, high nutritional demand, um, that first cutting hay comes pretty close uh, to meeting what they need, okay? Uh, again, not perfect, but pretty close. And if we look at the second cutting hay um, that tends to be higher in protein and energy, tends to be more digestible, again, it's not a perfect match, but it comes fairly close to um, meeting the needs of those, um, of those lactating does, okay? Um, so, you know, test your hay, uh, and then use those tests to kind of figure out what you're gonna be feeding to which of your, of your animals. I'm gonna show a difference of, uh, I'm gonna show how that, um, how that can make a, a uh, how, that, how that can make a difference, okay? So there's a simple technique that you can use called the Pearson square uh, to calculate simple rations. And the way that you work, um, we're gonna use an example with our lactating does here, okay? So you pick a parameter that you want to balance for, okay? And we're gonna use that 65% TDN in the lower right corner. So we put that in the center. And then we have the feeds that we're gonna be combining uh, to meet those needs. So we'll use our second cutting grass hay uh, at 63 TDN, okay? It's close, but it's a little bit short on, on energy. And then we're gonna be combining that with a 16% grain pellet. Grain pellets, um, you know, have a lot of corn, a lot of soybean, uh, other grains in them. Um, so they're pretty high in energy, about 82% TDN. The way that you use a Pearson square is you subtract, um, your target from the feed value diagonally. So 65 minus 63 is two and 82 minus 65 is 17. And then you read diagonally, or I'm sorry, directly across so that your ration is 17 parts hay and two parts grain. Now, if you calculate that out in terms of weights and everything like that, um, that means that the ration is approximately 90% hay and 10% grain. 
So if you've got a lactating doe consuming about five pounds of dry matter per day, that means that she'll get four and a half pounds of hay and about a half pound of grain per day. Okay. Um, if you don't have the actual process down, that's okay. If anyone's interested, I can provide um, you know, a link that, that walks you through the process pretty thoroughly later on. But the main thing that I just wanted to illustrate is keep an eye on that, that ration flow, four and a half pounds of hay and just a half pound of grain. Now, if I try to meet her needs with that first cutting hay, <clears throat> that's lower in energy, 55% TDN, and I go through the same, you know, subtractions, then our ration is going to be 17 parts hay and 10 parts grain. Now, that dough is going to be consuming that same five pounds of dry matter a day, but this time, um, that five pounds of dry matter a day is meaning that she's going to get three pounds of hay and two pounds of grain. Okay, so by going with the uh, lower quality hay uh, with a higher nutritional with, with animals that have a higher nutritional demand, you're going to have to feed about four times as much grain. Um, you know, and and when you get to a ration that high, that's you know around forty percent grain. Um, for one thing, that's going to be expensive. Um, you know, when I did these calculations, um, that was when grain was normal priced and um, it's certainly gone up since then. So there's gonna be certainly an expense with that. Um, and then also you get to a point where it may not always be healthy to have your animals consuming a lot of grain. Um, you know, cows, sheep, goats are, are built to consume and make good use of forages. Um, and while we can tweak that a little bit with concentrates, um, it's, it's a lot better for the animals and it's a lot better for your pocketbook um, the more that you can focus on, on forages. Okay, one last thing that I just wanna mention um, <clears throat> is uh, the idea of condition scoring. So, you know, we can evaluate forages by, um, by looking at them. We can evaluate forages by testing them. Um, but ultimately, if we're relating forage quality back to animal performance, then we want to make sure that our animals are doing as well as we think they should. You know, we can calculate things out on paper and we can get a pretty good idea, but we want to keep um, an eye on an animal, um, you know, to, to, to monitor things. Okay. And, you know, there's an old saying that um, back when I was in college, and um, was taking my fees and feeding class that the uh, instructor was fond of saying is that it's the eye of the master that fattens his stock. So um, many of you may be already um, familiar with the idea of condition scoring. Uh, if, if you're not, just really quickly, um, what we do is we score animals on a scale of uh, one to five. Um, where animals that are scoring really low, um, you know, in the ones or twos, um, look really gaunt. You can really see their bones. Uh, they don't have a lot of flesh on them. Um, their ribs are highly visible. Um, on the other end of the scale, uh, animal that's at a body condition of score of five is, um, is really fat. You really can't see the ribs. It's pretty roly-poly. Um, you can't really make out any of, of the bones. And that's not necessarily healthy either. Um, and again, that might be overfeeding. Instead, we're looking to keep our animals somewhere between a, um, you know, a three and maybe up to a five, depending on the stage of production. Um, you know, it's okay to let animals bulk up a little bit prior to um, kidding. But um, once they've kitted and they've been milking, um, you know, we want to keep them at around a body condition score of three. Um, and I don't, I, I looked all over the internet and couldn't find um, pictures of goats at different body condition scores. So, um, but to give you an idea with, with sheep, on the lower left corner, uh, I think you can see that that would be a very low 
a scoring animal. She just doesn't look healthy. She's, um, you know, she's um, unhealthy, uh, you know, thin to, a, to, a, to an unhealthy degree. And then on um, the lower right, uh, that that you has um, that you has had plenty to eat, and that might be okay if she's just about ready to to lamb. Um, but if she were at maintenance, then she's probably a little bit too fat. And then on the top, that uh, would be a uh, sheep at a condition score of around three, and uh, that that would be our target. So um, I know I've gone through a lot of information uh, relatively uh, pretty quickly there. Um, so I'm happy uh, to take any questions that anyone might have, uh, either about anything that I went over, or any other forage or forage quality related um, issues that you wanna talk about. Thank you very much. Um, I encourage anyone who has a question to type it into the chat. Um, so far, we have one question asking uh, if you'll be talking about the differences between grass and legumes. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, generally speaking, legumes will maybe be a little bit higher in energy and a little bit higher in protein. Um, but um, you can, you know, but I, I wouldn't say that that automatically means that legumes are superior as a, as a forage crop. Um, while they're a little bit higher than grasses, um, you can very much harvest grasses that are high enough quality to support um, strong animal production. You know, even if legumes are a little bit higher, grasses can be high enough. Um, so I, I, I understand that um, that this might be a sort of a nationwide audience or that some of, of you might be from other parts of the country uh, other than northern New England. In, th in this neck of the woods, um, it's really difficult to make alfalfa hay. Um, you know, we have a, a humid climate and um, those thick stems on alfalfa just take forever to dry down. Uh, we can make grass hay in about two or three days if we've got the right weather conditions, uh, but you'll usually have to tack an extra day or two onto that if we're looking at alfalfa or, or red clover. And to make matters worse, while we're tedding the hay to kind of keep it fluffed up so that it can dry down, uh, towards the end, we have to be careful because those leaves uh, become really brittle and will shatter off the stalks. So any of that you know, potential forage quality, um, a lot of it might not actually make it to the animal's mouth just because of the difficulty of handling the crop. So um, that would be some of the differences both in the, the nutritional content and, um, you know, in some of the handling. Next question we have, um, if our hay is not great, does it help to supplement with beet pulp? Um, it can. Um, I, I can't remember what the actual um, content, you know, nutritional content of beet pulp is. But as I understand it, because it's a byproduct of, um, I believe it's a byproduct of making beet sugar, um, I think it mainly has a lot of fiber in it. Uh, and some of that um, might be soluble fiber. And in some cases that that might be good. Um, you know, my daughters used to show um, in, in 4-H, they used to show beef cattle and they would always feed a bunch of beet pulp um, right before entering the show ring because that would kind of um, bulk the animal up, make her look nice and full in, in the show ring. Um, and there are other reasons that beet pulp might be a, a good feed in a ration, but because it has a lot of fiber and I think relatively low levels of protein or energy, um, that might not necessarily be the best supplement for hay that was maybe a little bit more mature or, uh, you know, than, than, than you'd like if you were feeding it to, um, you know, um, animals with a high nutritional demand. Um, 
I, I'd maybe look at going with some other kind of concentrate that would provide more energy and provide more protein. All right. The next question is around um, testing your hay for protein. Could you expand more about that, about uh, when people should be doing that, um, where it can be done, any recommendations that you have? Sure. <clears throat> um, so let me see. Um, you can test your hay at, at, at any time. Um, you know, the best way to, and the, the best way to do that is to get some sort of um, composite sample. I would recommend testing different lots of hay. So if you're bringing in some hay that's first cutting, and then you're bringing in some hay later on in the season that's second cutting, I would test those separately. Um, or if you're purchasing hay from two different sellers, uh, then I'd keep them separate. But um, for each lot, I would select maybe 15 or 20 bales um, at random. And I would take a subsample from each. Um, you know, the officially the best way to do it is to use a hay probe. This is uh, something that will bore into the uh, to the end of a bale, and you can pull out a core of hay from the entire bale. Uh, a lot of people don't have those, um, and if you're one of them, then using a grab sample is just fine. Um, just grabbing a handful of of hay from each of those twenty bales mixing them together, put them in like a barrel or a five gallon bucket or something like that. And then put some of that mixed hay in your sample bag and then send it off uh, to the lab. Um, you know, that's just a, a good routine thing to do every, every year. Uh, as far as where to send it, um, in, in this part of uh, the country, uh, there's a place in Ithaca, New York called Dairy One Forage Lab. Um, they work a lot with the dairy industry, but they have forage testing for, for all classes of, of livestock. Um, you know, a routine um, forage test, I believe, costs about $18, maybe $20. Uh, and that would provide all the information that you would need. Uh, in order to know how to make a good use of, of, of that forage. Um, other parts of the country um, would have other commercial labs. Um, as long as it's a you know, reputable accredited lab, um, you, know, uh, you, could, you can be quite confident in the results that you get from them. Do you have recommendations for um, a lot of our membership have uh, small farms with not a lot of hay storage. So mm -hmm. they are buying hay every month or two. Mm -hmm. So not really getting um, big bulk batches. Um, yeah, I guess in a case like that, in that case, I suppose, rather than doing it as an annual basis, maybe I just send in samples quarterly. Um, it kind of depends on where you're getting your hay in, in those small batches. Um, if you're working with a single uh, hay producer and um, you've got a good relationship with them and you know that their stuff is pretty consistent, then I think you could probably still get away with just sending in a sample once, maybe twice a year. Um, if you're getting it from multiple producers, um, then I might want to test a little bit more frequently. I don't think you have to go so far as to test every month, um, but maybe testing, you know, every few months just to kind of monitor the situation. Great. The next question says, I feed alfalfa hay. Could you comment on uh, calcium, phosphorus, and the relationship to urinary problems for weathers and bucks? Ooh. Um, well, to be honest, no. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I understand that, you know, the calcium to phosphorus ratio uh, is important, um, is something that we pay attention to. But to be honest, I'm not familiar enough with, I'm not enough of an animal nutritionist to relate that back to what, um, you know, to, to what uh, bucks and does need and what the difference is. Um, 
I do know that alfalfa can be higher in calcium that, you know, just because of the growing conditions um, for alfalfa, um, alfalfa can, you know, take up a lot of calcium. So the forage itself will be higher in things like, um, like, like calcium and some, some other nutrients. Um, but I don't think I could give you a good answer on how to relate that back to a actual goat's ration on, on that particular mineral balance. I'd, I'd have to look it up and do some reading first. Are there any other questions from the audience? I think I've gone through everything in the chat. Okay. Just some feedback from Christine. She's used Dairy One before and she said they were great and she had uh, results emailed within about a week. Oh, okay. So confirming that, yeah. Okay, yeah. They, well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I generally don't, you know, plug individual businesses or things, but, um, you know, they, they do a nice job and, um, you know, people, people are generally pretty happy. They're not the, um, you know, they're not the only, um, game in town. There are plenty of other labs that are capable of doing a good job, but, um, but, uh, yeah, they're, they, they, I, I, I've usually heard just, um, nothing but good from them. Great. Well, I don't see any other comments. So I want to thank you very much for spending uh, some time with us this evening after work hours. We really appreciate your willingness to do that. And also, if you can share with us the link um, to the tutorial for the Pearson Square, I think that's a super valuable tool that a lot of our producers will, will find very helpful in helping choose their feed rations. Sure. Okay. Um, do you want me to, um, can I, can I like email you a link sure. that you could then send out afterwards? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. We'll just include it in the YouTube notes so that anybody who watches it afterwards can check that out. Oh, okay. we have a question. If, um, Susan is asking, are you willing to share the slides? Sure. I can do that. Okay. Yep. Yep. Great. So, so uh, Susan, if you contact us, we can we can forward those slides to you as well. Okay. Yep. Thank you right. again. We really, really appreciate you uh, joining us for this call, and thanks, thanks uh, everybody that joined. All right. Well, thank you, thank you everyone. Um, happy to do it, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>